good thing we used the extra pipe for this Koopa catcher, huh, Mario? <laughs> Mistakes were made and animation happens. Even great cartoons have their minor errors and it's whatever, but sometimes there's those mistakes that just leave me wondering how they could happen. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, these are however many animation errors explained in no particular order. It's Juice and Jam time. If Five Nights at Freddy Got Finger taught us anything, it's nothing good ever happens at a Chuck E. Cheese, especially a parody version you'd find in a cartoon like Dexter's Laboratory. In an already trippy episode taking place in a Chubby Cheese's, Dexter and his family are subjected to a musical number from the Pizza Place's animatronics, some of which are obvious references to old Hanna-Barbera characters, symbolic of the lifeless robotic state channel Boomerang lies in. Once this hellish torture porn musical sequence ends, the audience celebrates the mercy God has spared them with. Sneaking hunk of grape, eh? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did the crowd just fly into nothingness? According to my industry contacts, that was in fact an animation error. The storyboard artist drew the crowd lifting up their arms and cheering, but when this was sent over to the animation studio in Korea, the animators thought they were flying like Superman. When the crew got the animation back, they were both confused yet found it so funny they decided to leave it in and add a sound effect. Way to make the best out of a situation. Yes. Pack your things. We're heading for Tokyo. Sweet! We're going on vacation! Before Steven Universe embarrassed every one of us with the constant anime references, Teen Titans was the biggest piece of weeaboo trash ever. What better to cap off the series than a TV movie where they go to Japan? It's Teen Titans Trouble in Tokyo. In a montage showing Robin and Starfire's date at a Japanese arcade, our Tamaranian girl is really shredding on Guitar Hero VR while a crowd starts forming around her. Among the crowd is a bunch of nobodies and... Beast Boy? But why is he Caucasian or Asian, I guess? This is Tokyo after all. Though I've heard a lot of people say anime characters can't be Japanese since their eyes are too big. I guess that makes sense. Only characters drawn with small eyes can be Asian. Characters like Krillin, Brock, Omi, Charlie Brown, Popeye, the Animaniacs, the Castle Adventure Time, Mickey Mouse, all Asian. So, when do we get to go see the Great Wall? Never. It's in China. Ooh. So why is this Beast Boy look like here when he's not supposed to be in this area during this scene? I think I remember message boards speculating it would tie into the final Teen Titans episode somehow. Clones? I don't know. Why was there another Red X? Was that really Terra? Maybe a clone of Terra? And maybe this is a clone of Beast Boy? Could be? Well, a few years back, I happened to ask Brienne Drewhart about this. She was a character designer for Season 3 and Beyond of Teen Titans, and also she has her own webcomic you all can read, Harpy G. What she explained in how animation works is when you're animating a crowd shot, you can't just tell the overseas animators, put a crowd here. Somebody has to design and approve each background character used for a shot. What must have happened is a Beast Boy model sheet somehow got mixed into the crowd sheets. Thus, he just ended up back there. Just a dumb little error. Any fan theories about this? All wrong. That's fandom. He could still be a robot. Check him for batteries. May I touch your face? Uh, oh sure. But, but why do you want to do that? It's the way I see. Uh, I, I hope you like what you see. Now, here's an animation error that never got on screen, but makes for a tragic story. Looking through John Kay's blog, the creator of Ren and Stimpy, there was this story posted by Will Finn. He's worked on a ton of miscellaneous animation jobs, everything between Stick It to Nim to Wreck-It Ralph 2. While working on the 80s He-Man TV series, Will was employed as cleanup. What cleanup do in animation is they get the crude storyboard roughs and draw them more clearly so it's more understandable to the overseas animators. This means they need to draw the characters as accurately as possible. To draw the characters on model, the crew referenced the model sheets given to them. It's the blueprints the artist must follow. One of the characters they had to draw was Ram Man. Don't turn your back on that guy. Ram Man? 
I've heard lots about you from the storyteller. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty famous guy. Cleanup sounds like a straightforward job, but there was one problem with the Ram Man model sheets. His backside was drawn with the thumbs flipped on the wrong side of his hands. No problem, this should be an easy fix. Just ignore that issue and draw it the correct way, but no. <laughs> The cleanup supervisor saw this issue and told the crew they had to follow what's on the model sheets until they can make and approve new model sheets. So production continued as planned while following the blueprints. A few weeks passed and finally the corrected model sheets were given. This means the crew had to redo everything that was already done involving those sheets. This is what happens when people don't question the rules they're told to follow. Good wall. Hey, nice and solid. Watch it, soldier. When I want my feet lit, I'll ask for it. I want my feet lit. This is as low as it gets, the Mario show. What a goddamn mess this was. It was a miracle whenever they managed to keep Mario and Luigi the right color for more than five minutes. Purely by brand recognition, it staggered through 91 episodes. I don't even know what type of errors to start with on this series. So here's a mistake from the Christmas special I've never seen done anywhere else. So, what do you think? Uh, don't try wearing it in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Did you catch that? If we freeze frame, there's this W2 form here. I don't know what the correct name is, but this paper is really the animation equivalent of one of those movie clipboards that tell the editor what scene this is. But now we know this was animated in China by Pacific Rim Animation. Yes, the term Pacific Rim existed before the movie. Also, if you're gonna seek out this error yourself, it only shows up in the Shout Factory DVD release and not the rips on YouTube, wherever they came from. Maybe Netflix? Next up is what this countdown spot was reserved for. Here's an error that's pretty notorious found in the Indiana Jones parody episode, Raiders of the Lost Mushroom. To capture Bowser, I mean King Koopa as he was called back then, Mario and his friends team up with Indiana Joe. For no discernible reason, he does not have a face. Whoa! Who are you, hero dude? The bravest, baddest treasure hunter in Jungle Land, Indiana Joe! People refer to this as an error when it's really just a confusing design choice. It's not like they just forgot to draw his face the whole time. They're not that stupid. But I wasn't gonna let this mystery slide, so I messaged the writer of this episode. I would ask the character designer, but yeah, I'm not bothering all those people. I received no word back yet from the writer as this video goes public, but if there are any updates, check the description below for anything. As we wait for the writer to get back to me, I always had my own theory as why Indiana Joe had no face. Consider this, what if this was all a reference to that scene in the first Indiana Jones movie where that one Fox News broadcaster gets his face melted off? Maybe Joe was a guy who looked inside the Ark of the Covenant and that's why he doesn't have a face. That seems like an obvious gag and I'm betting that's what the writer intended so maybe Joe's backstory got cut for time. But how about you all? Do any of you have a theory as to why he has no face? Post it down below. Ow! Help us! Put us down! It's kinda cheating putting so many 80s cartoons on this list. They didn't exactly have the best quality control back then, nor did anyone really care. Just look at the G1 Transformers episode, Child's Play, where the Autobots land on a planet full of giant aliens. The giants see these robots as nothing more than mere pets. So both good and evil sides of the Transformers seek away back to Earth. Far away from this episode chock full of errors. The Decepticons make it there first, where they are promptly eaten by crocodiles. Get this thing off me! That doesn't seem plausible, then again, that is Starscream. On the Autobot side, their only way back to Earth is via a toy rocket. Yeah, here it is! It's really neat! It flies all around my room, up to the ceiling, and everything! Oh, if that toy rocket can fly around your room, then I'm sure it could totally break through the atmosphere. After some modification, the rocket is ready for flight, and we get this next scene that went viral for its confusing nature. I, uh, <laughs> I feel the same way about you, Nitro. What? 
just happened? It was simply a layering error. The rocket the Transformers melted into was supposed to be on top of them. With today's technology, I could easily fix this. Look, just copy the object by itself and overlay it on top of the same footage, and immediately it's fixed. I, uh, <laughs> I feel the same way about you, Nitro. <laughs> Partially fixed, the whole episode's a mess. I guess to production, this was a B-list episode. The type of episode that's filler and made with less effort while the crew focuses their time and budget on more important episodes. They could have done some animation reshoots for this, but it wasn't worth their time. Strike one, Decepticons! The Transformers will return after these messages. The Simpsons is brought to you by Mountain Dew. Get vertical with the power of Mountain Dew. There's a real uncanniness to the first season of The Simpsons. Nothing from those 90s episodes looked like what we're used to now, and everything was so unrefined. So much sloppiness like the first episode featuring Lisa in a school pageant not wearing pants. The audio commentary states she was supposed to be wearing a body stocking, but the end result just looks off-putting. Off-putting such as when Mr. Smithers' first appearance was portrayed by Dennis Rodman. Yummy cotton candy machine. <laughs> but later appearances were back to yellow skin. The explanation for the change varies. There's a quote floating around that states, It would have been a bad idea to have a black subservient character. I can't find the actual article that was said in and no single person is credited for saying it besides, quote, the staff. It does sound plausible. Maybe they didn't want to offend by having one of the few black characters be Mr. Burns' servant. It's kind of like the 80s Ninja Turtles cartoon where the villain Shredder had his assistant be the scientist Baxter Stockman. He was white in this cartoon, but in the comics and other cartoons, he was black. For a better source reasoning, Simpsons writer Jay Coogan in a Reddit AMA answered this mystery with, Originally, he was gay and black, and we actually drew him purple in his first show, but we thought it was too much, so we just kept him gay. Unquote. Oh, thank God they never watched Moonlight. A black person who was also gay and purple, according to this poster, would have warped their minds. Smithers could have won Best Picture, but they pussed out. Also, that quote, does that mean black people were originally going to be represented as purple on the show? And why make the change after he was already established? Well, it's a good thing we have a TMZ video of creator Matt Groening explaining it to a very subtle interviewer. Hey, I saw that in the early episodes, Smithers was black. That was a mistake. That was a mistake. The Smithers but, was but, black. Yeah, okay, yeah, it was an, an animation mistake. Why did you change it? Because it was a mistake. Why didn't you keep it him black? Well, he was he was always yellow, and then they painted him wrong once. That's all. And in one episode, he was black. I think you should have kept him black. I think that was cool. Well, you know, here's the thing: when there were glitches and mistakes, yeah, it stayed that way. It was an accident, and it just it looked. It was an accident. Yes. Um, why are all the characters yellow? What an interesting and remarkable question that no one's ever asked me before. Okay, what, I got, I got one, last, one last thing. Yeah. Why do they all have four fingers? Hang on, let me uh, reach for my bottle of Topo Chico mineral water. Good stuff. I may mock that TMZ interviewer's lack of subtlety at trying to cause controversy where there is none, but you know how many Hungry Man frozen dinners that footage bought him? A week's worth. He would have bought more, but they wouldn't fit in the car he lives in. As Matt replied, Waylon Smithers being yellow was a last minute change the overseas animators never got the memo to. Simple as that. But this error ties into one of the biggest Simpsons mysteries, Blue Shirt Bart. <laughs> Little calming blue. Hey, where's your blue shirt? I don't have a blue shirt. If you have noticed from the older Simpsons merchandise, Bart wears a blue t-shirt, when by default he has always worn a red shirt. Even on the Tracy Ullman shorts, Bart's shirt was red, yet the toys say otherwise. There is a popular fan theory stating this color error was in fact intentional. The official Bart shirts were purposely blue. That way, if anyone sees a red-shirted Bart toy, Fox's lawyers will be able to tell it's a bootleg. Yes, this is a real theory people believe. That's just stupid. 
stupid. Why purposely make inaccurate merch? That would just encourage people to buy the bootlegs. Here's what really happened. Just like with Smithers Design, the merchandise was in development before the first episode was completed and the designs were finalized. This was the 80s. Animation was used heavily for toy sales. Fox just wanted to have some merch ready, so they sent what images were finished to toy companies. Thus, Blue Shirt Bart was turned into official merch. If you don't believe me, let me bring up this other fun fact about the Simpsons arcade game. In certain animations, Marge is seen with rabbit ears, a reference to the creator Matt Groening's Life in Hell comics. The ears were going to be a big secret Marge was hiding until the planned final episode of The Simpsons, whenever that is. But the rabbit ears were another thing scrapped from development that still ended up in the merchandise. This kind of stuff still happens, even as recent as 2016 for the Disney movie Moana. <laughs> During development, the crew were still figuring out the chicken Hey Hey's personality. Early drafts had him angrier or stoic, but they didn't feel that was working and contemplated cutting him out completely. They later settled on making him more derpy for the film. The change was made too late as some promotional material and merchandise is still reflective of Hey Hey's earlier plans. So that whole conspiracy that Blue Shirt Bard was a ploy to catch bootleggers. Nah, it was just Fox rushing a product out the door. They didn't give a shit. Like they really need help to distinguish between official and bootleg merchandise. Oh, is this official? I don't know. <laughs> nah, that's silly. Get out of here, you crazy kids. As the creator of The Simpsons, this makes my eyes hurt. What's the problem? It's completely off model. Off model of from what? He has supposed to have nine spikes of hair on his head. The pupils are the wrong size. <laughs> Behold, the last Butterfinger in the whole house, and I have it. Dad says no teasing. Na 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 na. Whoa! Check out the smooth, chocolatey outside. The crispity, crunchity, peanut buttery inside. Dad says if you make a scream, you're dead meat. You wouldn't scream. Dad! Now what? Never mind. Nobody better lay a finger on my Butterfinger.